Welcome to University Drive, your pathway to the transformational work of University of the Bahamas. Our goal is to build a better Bahamas by shaping tomorrow's leaders today, finding solutions to challenges, and forging new opportunities for growth. University Drive, where faculty, staff, students, and alumni travel the road of progress together with you. Welcome to University Drive. I'm your host, Nikki Bo, and I'm excited to be joining you again for another exciting edition of our show here on Guardian Talk Radio. My guest today is Ms. Erin Brown, and she is no stranger to us, but she is the Director of Compliance and Disabilities at the University of the Bahamas, and she is going to share the services and support that, she, that her office offers our students. And so Erin, thank you so much for choosing and agreeing to be a guest on today's show. Thank you for having me. I love coming on University Drive. We love having you. Erin, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself to our listening audience. People are familiar with you as you wear many hats within our community and you've been an advocate for the disabled for quite some time. And I remember when you and I had a meeting you introduced yourself to me as you would in your community so that people could really appreciate who Erin Brown is. I'm going to ask you to give that same introduction. Tell us who you are and um, your role here at the institution. Thank you. Yes, it has become my standard introduction as we enhance, encourage, and give examples of what inclusive communication um, looks like, feel like, and, and can be duplicated. So my name is Erin Brown. I am the Director of Disabilities and Compliance at the University of the Bahamas. I am a short blonde hair, black female, wearing today brown tinted glasses. My pronouns are she and her. And I self-identify as a limb difference individual, also known as an above the knee amputee. Thank you for that introduction, Erin. Erin, what purpose does an introduction like that serve and why is it important for you to give those details in an introduction? Well, it is important to use that form of introduction, and that's very basic because I can also say what I'm wearing, what my background or environment is, and what this fosters is access. Access for persons who are not using visual um, cues, their sight to receive information, content, or key points that are important to a conversation or even to the person that is presenting. And so it allows image description, which allows persons who are using their audio receptors to receive the conversation, to receive the content or material, to know who is speaking to them. Um, and it's also a really good icebreaker. You know, a lot of times we, got, we, we get very filled with anxiety and, and stage fright when we're in spaces, but it gives you another layer of introdu introducing yourself in a very organic way that persons can appreciate and hopefully join in. Yes, I think I have to try that one of these days in terms of introducing myself and it flows off of your tongue oh so easily and smoothly. <laughs> Um, I guess you've been doing it um, frequently enough that it's almost second nature. It's like me saying, hi, I'm Nikki Bo. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, <laughs> absolutely. Tell us how long have you been at the University of the Bahamas and give us a general overview of the role and function of the Office of Compliance and Disabilities. And I'm asking you that because normally when we think of compliance, we think of the financial services sector, right? <laughs> And, and that's not what this role is about. So give people a better understanding of what the Office of Compliance and Disabilities is all about. Wonderful. So yes, so this office was established in 2017, 2017, 2018. I came into office in November of 2019. And so during that time when I came in, we immediately entered into the pandemic in 2020. And so a lot of my first three years here, about two and a half, three years were remotely. 
And so crafting with that would be like for our administration faculty, um, staff and students at the university when accessing academic accommodations, digital access support, and um, making sure that we have the ability to provide access um, for all learners within our university campus. And that includes UB North. So it was a huge task coming in um, under those circumstances. But when we returned back to campus, we just hit the road running. We were able to now do a lot of assessments and evaluation that provided us with the format and the templates and the processes that we currently use now as we strengthen our access, inclusion, and opportunities through inclusive education strategies. And so the Office of Disabilities and Compliance Purpose is to ensure equal access, promote inclusivity, and foster a culture of excellence within our institution. Um, through our mission, goals, and um, vision, we are dedicated to empowering individuals with disabilities, advocating for their rights and cultivating an environment where diversity, equity, and inclusion are celebrated. So some of the services that we provide are reasonable academic and social accommodations. So we call it academic and non-academic accommodation services for our students with disabilities that not only protects their right, but it promotes disability inclusion on an accessible campus. And some of those um, services would include um, priority registration, um, academic accommodations that may mean that when it's time for you to take your tests or examinations, you may need additional time. So you're going to proctor in our academic testing services department that supports separate and individual proctoring for students or faculty that need it. Class scheduling, mobility assistance, student support services, as well as sign language interpretation, um, alternate texts. We do have a population of students that may come in that may be blind, low vision, visually impaired. And I dare to even say, Sometimes when your scripts for your eyeglasses don't come in time and you need the additional support, we're able to provide you with alternate text from text to speech or enlarging the prints. Um, and we also have a inclusive computer lab and an accessible student lounge that we have now coined. And when I say we, I mean our students. Our Mingos decided that our space should be called the Mingos Access Center. And so this is a space where all of these things happen and it also fosters inclusive social engagement. So peer tutoring happens here, trainings, CPR trainings, safe zone trainings. We have programs, games, activities, workshops. They all happen in the Mingos Access Center. And I would love to also share that because the question we usually get is, well, what type of disabilities do we provide these services for? It's all, all of them, all varying types of disabilities and combinations of disabilities we provide services for. So that can be physical disabilities, where it is, um, you may be blind, deaf, um, hearing impaired, low vision, um, you may have psychosocial disabilities, and that's along the mental health um, alignment. We also have immunocompromised. We heard a lot of that in comorbidities um, within the pandemic, where those are high risk factors, sickle cell, um, lupus, all of these things that might cause or impact you through episodic episodes. We also, uh, oh, and that also includes pregnant women. <laughs> And, and I, I always hear a sigh of relief, like, yes, thank you. We are seen <laughs> when I say yes, that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and so, yes, any chronic illnesses. So it is the full array of disabilities because we are very equitable in our services. And so we do an assessment each semester to ensure that whatever academic accommodations you are receiving or you are about to receive because you've requested something very similar, we're able to retain or manage it throughout your time here at the university. 
So Erin, you mentioned a lot of the physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. What about the learning disabilities? Yes. Let's talk about that. What are some of the um, learning disabilities that are resident here among our student population that your office supports mm -hmm. and makes sure that they in receive, you know, the access that they need? Yes, access and the support. And so over the years, the terminology has changed. And so at first it was intellectual disabilities. Now we use the term neurodiverse. And so the neurodiverse disabilities include learning disabilities such as dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia. Most of these things speak to either delays or, or relay um processes that would need additional steps in order to get and execute the goal. We also, for those in the neurodiverse, ADD, ADHD, those are very common um, learning disabilities, neurodiverse disabilities that persons experience throughout their lifetime. And you find within academia that most of those go undetected. So they are the ones that we call non-apparent or invisible disabilities that persons kind of just say to themselves, I just don't like math. And therefore they stay away from it where it can be with an assessment, you realize that you actually living with dyscalculia that um, and you now need to learn a different method, a different way of um, processing and, and completing formulas and solutions. And so that's where you need the support because now you need to retrain yourself. You need to, to recognize that when you are experiencing these effects, you can now kick in those tools that we have provided ask for additional support, or when you come into our space through pair tutoring, we work through pair tutoring to also train those pair tutorers how to utilize a lot of the tools that will help with learning disabilities as well. So you mentioned a word and I wanna talk about it and I want you to elaborate on the importance of people being sensitized to two words that I've heard you use or, or that I've become familiar with mm -hmm. um, as a result of my interaction with you. There are visible and invisible disabilities. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we only pay attention to the visible disabilities because it's what we can see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why, how do we get people to recognize and realize that there are also invisible, invisible disabilities that we need to be cognizant of, aware of, sensitized to and sensitive towards the individuals who may be experiencing or have these invisible disabilities. Mm -hmm. let's, let's touch on that for me, please. Well, what I would say is we know that human nature is whatever we can see with our eyes um, is what we would consider a fact and that is exactly what it is and it cannot be anything else. Um, the reason why we ensure that we are providing services for all disabilities, because not one person with a disability or a disabled person is alike. They can have a primary disability, which may be a visible one, but also living with non-apparent disabilities, whether that is um, depression, anxiety, dyscalculia, um, dyslexia. Um, you may be living with nervous disorders. You may find that you are also dealing with maybe being a diabetic and some days you're really up and other days you're really down. And so when persons see you on those up days, it's they, they, they're like, oh, well, she's fine. And then those other days or maybe the same day later on, you're all the way down and then they're wondering what happened. Mm -hmm. And it's because when you're living with a disability, you recognize that what happens is you find yourself having to defend your disability most of the time when you have a non-apparent disability because it, it may be episodic or it may be temporary or it may be um, because of a medical diagnosis. But we all need to recognize at the end of the day that all of the different types of disability, anything that limits, reduce your everyday, your um on average engagement 
limits it, reduces it, or even stops it is considered a disability, whether it's temporary or whether it is um, permanent. And so it's much more difficult to recognize the non-apparent one because it takes an individual to be very comfortable and feeling very safe to self-identify with a non-apparent disability. I myself living as an above the knee amputee and I use a wheelchair or a pair of crutches or a prosthetic, you can physically see that I have a disability but nobody sees the non-apparent disabilities. And usually when I share, I would share my primary disabilities because that's the ones that you usually see. But if we start to now dive deeper, then I'm able to share all of the non-apparent disabilities. So for those persons, um, when we're talking about supporting and being very sensitive or aware of non-apparent disabilities, it absolutely starts with the fundamental being safe to share and knowing that in sharing, it's not to dissect your condition, your disability, your experience. It's more to find the gaps of where we're not providing support or access and therefore strengthening it. And so it's, it's a bit of, it can be very tough for some persons and for other persons, it, it, it doesn't, it isn't as tough. And I think it starts from the point where we recognize as a human being, we will all acquire a disability, whether you were born with a disability, whether due to an accident, incident, illness, stress, genetics, aging, <laughs> or for any reason, you now living with a disability. It's a we conversation and we need to not only have empathy, but we need to recognize that in Asking, it's not a bad word to say the word disability, but you would want to recognize and value that person for exactly who they are authentically when you do ask. I hope that kind of brings it around. It certainly does. You know, you said something very profound just now that at some point or another in all of our lives, we will all have a disability of a varying degree caused by various factors and, and I think most of us do already, and we don't really see it as a disability, but when you wear glasses, that is a, that is visual impairment that without those, life could be completely different. I mean, just in the office yesterday, I took, they was, somebody asked me something about my glasses and I'm like, the only thing I don't do in my glasses is pretty much sleep in them um, yeah. because you're dependent on them. Erin, you also mentioned the fact when you spoke about yourself personally, mm -hmm. that your disability requires you to either use a wheelchair, crutches, or a prosthetic. Mm -hmm. What determines when you use which one, if you don't mind sharing? <laughs> sure. <laughs> and so I will say, first and foremost, a prosthetic, a wheelchair, and a pair of crutches are all luxuries. Unfortunately, within our community, it is not standard um, for you to have access to any of these things. And so the fact that I have an option of three, it's an absolute blessing. Um, and it's also an opportunity why I advocate so heavily for inclusive health care and inclusive spaces and access, because these things are designed as adaptive equipment to support a person, whether it's temporary or whether it's permanent. And so I decide when I'm using my prosthetic, I tend to use my prosthetic one when it actually fits because yes, sometimes you can outgrow your prosthetic um, or it, it, it needs some maintenance and you're unable to get it. And so you can't use that right then and there. But I tend to use that if I have long hours. So if I know that I'm going to be doing a complete day of moving around, I would wear my prosthetic if, if I have it available to me. Um, my crutches, I tend to use that a whole lot more. Um, and it's purely because um, in the Bahamas, we are still very much trying to retrofit a lot. And, um, and when I say retrofit, that also means amending a lot of the things that we have done. So that's from the choice of our flooring. You would find that even if you're using a pair of crutches or you are using both of your feet, the flooring can absolutely have you 
on the ground. And so when you're now using an adaptive device, whether it's raining, whether it's it's just a wet day or it's, it's, it's humid or the flooring is just that slick, you may fall. But I find that I, with using a crutches, I can maneuver a bit better. If the aisles are too small, if there are boxes inside of a space I need to get over, I can do that more efficiently with my crutches. I'm just, I just have to be very aware when it's wet and the type of flooring because I will refuse entering into spaces if I recognize that that type of flooring may not be the best for me to use right now um, or to enter into that space. I can also use stairs with my prosthetic and my crutches. My wheelchair, I tend to use that more during my work day when I'm using a pair of crutches because I'm on the university, which is a large university. And so being able to maneuver a bit easier with my wheelchair in way of access ramps, sidewalks, um, some of the paved roads. And, um, and then we also have available in the office a device that makes my manual wheelchair into an electric wheelchair. Because I know y'all have seen me on campus zooming and beep, beep, <laughs> hailing everyone um, as I go from each campus areas, from meetings or meeting with students or faculty. Um, but that has helped me tremendously as well because it does take a lot to manually push yourself. So yes, there are options. Um, that I am able to use, um, but they are all absolute luxuries for me to have. Erin, you, I never thought of it that way. I mean, perspective is so amazing and interesting. And I guess knowledge is power because it's things that those of us that don't necessarily need to use them take for granted. Mm -hmm. So question, Erin, is there a place around town where if I have a pair of crutches that I could donate them? Is there a place where if I have a wheelchair, somebody that may have, you know, had a wheelchair, used a wheelchair, but may have passed away and, and a family is left with a wheelchair, mm -hmm. someplace where we can donate that so that somebody that really needs to use it mm -hmm. can access it. I think for a lot of us that don't necessarily have family members in the community or just pure ignorance, we don't know where or how we can help this community. So before we proceed, I want you to share for people that may have these adaptive equipment mm -hmm. that you call luxury, because I have some pretty much brand new pair of crutches at home from my son that I would love to donate. Yes. For people that may have this adaptive equipment because they may have had a temporary disability that's not permanent, how can they transfer that to somebody that may have a permanent disability that can benefit from that use? Yes. And guess what? There are various places. Um, there are disability related um, organizations. There are community centers. Even some of the urban renewal centers will take them. Um, I, I usually, and I'll be honest with you, even here at the university, when we have persons donating, I usually put in requests for some of our students because they need wheelchairs, crutches. So I also accept those here that we can now distribute to our registered students, um, not only here as undergraduates, but also graduates, because our office stay in contact with our graduates with disabilities as well. And we know that these devices Sometimes or most of the times, if you're using them every day, they need to be maintenance and or replaced. <laughs> so, um, but one of the main spaces that persons, when they're not sure exactly what, where or how, they can contact the National Commission for Persons with Disabilities. Um, it's literally located off of JFK, which is now next to the new Bank of the Bahamas. Um, but that's what houses in the Ministry of Social Service that house the National Commission for Persons with Disabilities. You are able to not only um, request assistance, you're able to donate there as well. You're able to um, request accessible parking decals that can be used around the Bahamas. We also offer that service here for our on-campus um, administration, faculty, staff, and students to receive an accessibility decal, parking decal that can be used on the campus. 
but we have applications for both the National Commission for Persons with Disabilities decals, as well as when you need to register. So one of the main things I would encourage persons to do, because we do recognize in disaster and emergency and just in everyday budgeting, annual reports, we do not have adequate um, data collection of persons with disabilities, marginalized groups, or disaggregated data. I would encourage you, even with the devices that you have and you'd like to donate them, look around your community and see who needs to be registered and give that assistance of helping them get registered. There is an online link. There is um, hard paper. You can physically take them in. Um, there's many ways that we can also support them. Um, when you don't have something to donate physically, you can also donate your time, your knowledge, and give the gift of access and inclusion to them. Thank you so much for that, Erin. We're going to get, we're going to take our first break here on the show. When we come back, I want to delve deeper into what access and academic accommodations look like for students on campus and how your office helps to augment those services for our students and what it means to be registered. So we're going to delve a little deeper and talk about that. We take our first break here on University Drive. We'll be right back. The one big draw of doing a doctoral degree here is that you don't have to move and you don't have to um, take your family to a different place and so you can do it right here. The same abilities that you would have in a UK or with America with being able to research is available here. And we now have all these facilities and so they can take advantage of it at a much cheaper cost to the individual. Chapter One Bookstore is proud to serve the students, faculty, and staff of the University of the Bahamas and the community at large. We are the premier choice for the purchase of university textbooks and supplies and UB logo apparel, paraphernalia, and gifts. We also carry a wide variety of school supplies, learning aids, and leisure books. Visit our coffee center for all of your printing, copying, and binding needs. Chapter One Bookstore is located on the ground floor of the Michael H. Eldon Complex on University Drive. Shop with us on Monday through Saturday. You can contact us at 397-2650 or email at chapter1 at ub.edu.bs. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Chapter One Bookstore. Chapter One, the premier choice. My name is Jeannie Gibson. I'm the policy assistant here at the Government and Public Policy Institute. The series that we normally do on a quarterly basis, one of those is Meet the Policymakers series, is to actually engage the policymakers to discuss relevant policies to what's going on relating to those policies here in the country, as well as to give the public an opportunity to hear and actually discuss it with the policymakers. Welcome to Independence Cafeteria, home of affordable, diverse, and delectable dishes that your taste buds will love. Choose from our everyday menu of baked chicken, wings, or fish fingers, or our extensive salad bar. Build your own pasta, grab something hot from the grill, or ask about our special of the day. Our full team of culinary professionals can't wait to serve you. We're located in Independence Park, at University of the Bahamas' Oaksfield campus. Call us at 302-4390. Download the app or order online at www.independencecafeteria.com. Your taste buds will thank you. Welcome back to University Drive. I'm your host, Nikki Bo. If you're just joining the conversation, 
My guest today is Erin Brown. She is the Director of Compliance and Disabilities here at the University of the Bahamas. And the central role and function of her office is to provide access to our students and our stakeholders that have visible and invisible disabilities, whether they are temporary or permanent, and making sure that they have the resources they need in order to function here on our campus and to aid in their students' success. And so, and we're gonna delve a little deeper. I've, for, our, for the sake of our listening audience, because I'm sure there are some parents, there are some relatives, there are even some students listening to you who may not know what it means to be registered with the Office of Disabilities and Compliance. Walk us through the process of registering and who should register and how many students do you currently have registered? Oh, wow. Yes. So that is a very important question. And why it is important, we are finding more and more since the inception of the campus and we're absolutely back on campus 100%. We have gotten additional increase influx of persons who are now registering with the office and are being referred to the office. So it is good to know that the word is out there, that the Office of Disabilities and Compliance is here and is ready to not only register our students with disabilities, but also provide them with support. And so students or parents who are listening and who are considering can my child, should my child, um, is it a good idea? What is available to my child who may live with a disability or who may need additional support? Because all learners are who we service. All learners are who is the target market in academia. And so whether it's full-time or part-time, know that an educational journey is filled with challenges. I mean, adjustments, new adventures, but also it is now time to advocate, self-advocating for your needs. So your student that you're thinking about your child, I want you to sit down um, with them and ask them, what, do, what, what would they like to do? Um, because I, I think a lot of things that happens within our community, our disabled community, is we don't have these conversations with our, our family members, our children, um, persons who are now coming of age and they're graduating and we're trying to figure out career, um, leadership, what are we going to do for the rest of our lives? Have that conversation with them because that's where it starts of how the office of disabilities and compliance would be able to support their desire, their goals, but also to support you as a advocate, an ally um, for your loved one to be successful. And so we encourage each of you to go on our website, which is ub.edu.bs, um, www.edu.bs ub.edu.bs and check out our policy for students with disabilities. It not only gives you a really good barometer, which we have amended, especially after the pandemic, we've been um, reforming a lot of our policies to ensure access and inclusion for all of our students. But if you look at that current policy that is there, it's going to give you a better understanding of how the university is prepared to support our students, but also some of the things that you can now start even from now to get your student into transition. High school, college, university, technical, vocational spaces, different ball game. And so we need to ensure that their goals are not only aligned with their access, which is a human right, but we make sure that they are able to articulate or to learn how to advocate their needs. Because in university setting, in academia, they're gonna have to do that. And so it's not gonna be mommy and daddy and auntie and sister and brother making those calls. <laughs> it's gonna be them and you can support them, but we want, them to amplify their voices because their voices are very important. And so the process isn't that hard, isn't that difficult. It isn't long. What it allows us to do is 
um, we were able to, due to the pandemic, we were able to transition into a lot of digital access. So our forms, once you email disabilitiesoffice at uv.edu.bs and request or say that you're interested in coming into the university, what are the next steps? We can invite you for a Mingos Access Center tour. We can then start the conversation and give you some tools. We have a lot of community programs that we provide that are focused on transitioning from high school to university learning. Um, but we would then be able to, once you have filled out the application, which is also online, um, and whether you self-identified with a disability then or now, we were able to send you those documents. And those documents are simple intake form that collects your information, a written request form that gives you the ability to now say exactly what your needs are, things that you have been using, um, what your major is, things that will help us to assess where your needs are. We then have an assessment form, which is for medical verification, whether that is any medical practitioner, it doesn't have to be just your primary doctor. It can be a physio, a physical therapist. It could be a speech therapist. It can be um, occupational therapist. It can be any of those practitioners that are there to who can speak to your current condition, experience, or even treatments that you are receiving. Um, and ongoing treatments. It doesn't have to have stopped, but it may actually be continuing as well. Once that is done, you turn in your class schedule, your student ID, and we do an intake with you in person with our intake coordinator, and boom, your academic accommodations are created. It is then sent to the faculty and you, because once again, self advocacy. We want to ensure that you are clear on what academic accommodations you are receiving, as well as the faculty, and to know that the office is the space that advocate with and for you during this time. We give support to our faculty as well as the student, because if we need to make any amendments, if they need any additional support, we are prepared to provide that. And so that happens every semester because we know each semester your courses are going to change. So you need to be able to have the ability to flex and adapt um, if we need to change anything as you go along your undergraduate journey. Erin, thank you so much. So, okay, so somebody, you said a whole lot, a whole, whole, whole lot for people to process. So let's break this down so that people can have an even better appreciation. Let's say that I come in, I register as a student and I have a physical disability and I, I'm, in, I'm in, a, in a wheelchair or on crutches. How would the office support me, a student like me? So if you come into the office and you said, hi, I'm a registered student and I would need um, some support for my classes, we will then give you an intake form and the intake form without having to ask you um, right there and then verbally will allow you to write confidentially um, in your own words exactly what your needs are. And so that would be the written request form. And um, the form, the questions are aligned to, to allow you to be very organic or authentic in your responses. So you, we may ask, um, what are some of the things you need to support right now um, in your current classes? Are you using any digital te technological um, support or equipment? to participate in class, yes or no. If you say yes, then you're able to provide that as well. So once, you, once you've completed those forms, we will then give that to the intake coordinator on that same day, and they will review that and have an interview with you. During that interview, they will go through those things. 
if you are a wheelchair user because of accident and it's something temporary, we're still able to provide you with academic accommodations. And so those accommodations may be that you may have classes that are on the second floor. We will now request that they are moved to the first floor. It may be that you are in a space that doesn't have any access ramps or the access ramp is inadequate for whatever reason. We're able to evaluate that and then pivot and move those classes or provide additional support or a action step for our physical um, facilities to repair that ramp or repair that um, sidewalks to ensure that it's safe and that you're able to use that. Your request may not even be from an academic um, accommodation side that you need additional time. It may just be physical structures and that is fine. Then we focus on that. You will not receive accommodations that speak to maybe additional time wearing hair, noise canceling headphones, um, wearing shades during class because you might have light sensitivities or you might be prone to seizures from flickering lights or on and off lights. Um, there are various things that can be provided, but we do take the time to ensure that what we are providing is one that is suited for that individual and their needs. And so once that has been done, you provide your class schedule, your photo ID. If you now need a decal to access the parking spaces, you would be able to fill that out. We will also ask if you need one for the Bahamas, because once again, we do have the applications for the National Commission for Persons with Disabilities here, as long as well as the registration. So we try to combine a lot of the services that we can provide in that one visit so that you don't have to come back and forth unless you're just visiting the Mingos Access Center to use the computer lab, hang out, play games, catch a program, whatever it is. Um, but once that is done, after that day is done, we then send your academic accommodations to your lecturers and yourself so that you're aware of what your needs are or what your academic accommodations have been approved for that particular semester. Thank you. I, I'm sure that is very insightful for a lot of people realizing and recognizing that students are being accommodated to this extent. Let's talk about the Mingos Access Center. This is something that you've led the charge on. Um, you're very passionate about it. Talk to us about the Mingos Access Center and how that has become a safe space for students. Why was that Mingos Access Center so important for you? The Mingos Access Center was important because it was important to students. We found, um, we know that, that we live with a stigma when we hear the word disabled, disability. And a lot of times we say to ourselves, you know, that's not something that I would want to be attached to my, to my name, attached to my representation or um, anything that I'm doing. And so we had to face the reality is that a lot of students needed assistance but they really weren't forthcoming because of the word disability. And so we, we became very intentional and um, strategic in the way we communicated with our current students, as well as those prospective registered students who need the assistance, but still felt a bit of pushback of actually showing up and requesting the assistance and the support. And so, we worked on reframing um, that disability isn't a bad word. It's a part of your identity and using the identity first language, which is disabled person and the person first language, which is a person with the disability and giving more awareness of how euphemistic language as differently able, which had seems to be very trending and um, used to describe or acknowledge persons with disabilities, how harmful it is to use those terms. Because what it continues to allow when we use those terms, us not to self-identify in the varying disabilities that we have. And therefore we're not 
counted in applications? When have you saw an application that had disability on it? Select all that applies. Um, you, you rarely see that. And it's because we need to now change the value, the, the energy, the representation, the, the, the importance of why we need to organically, authentically show up in all our characteristics as um, gender, um, religion, um, all of these things that we consistently see there, socioeconomic spaces, your location, your date of birth, all of these things are there, but not disability. So long story short, we, um, as we were talking to students about it, we said, okay, we recognize that the Office of Disabilities and Compliance, it just sounds so formal, even though we provide so many things. By this time, we had an inclusive computer lab where students who are able, not able to go up on the second floor computer labs can come down to our ground floor. Um, the, the Just the whole vibe and feel in the space had changed because we had furniture, we had a fridge, a microwave, we had more students coming in. And it was like, well, when we come here, we come here and it's very accessible. We, you know, we don't, we don't even have to think twice. We know if we ask for this or ask for that, it's here. And so they said, okay, how about the Mingos Access Center? And, um, and so the short term is MAC. And the minute they said it, <laughs> we all just looked at each other and went, you're absolutely right. It is a space that is focused on access because access is a human right. And so from then we just, we kept it going. Our hashtags became Mingo's access, Mingo's inclusion, Mingo's opportunities. Because when you enter into this space, all Mingo's, all learners are able to experience an inclusive communication, inclusive engagement, meet new friends, diverse friends, learn something new, um, garner some additional tools, whether it is academic tools, whether it is digital tools, resources, handheld um, device components that you can use. Um, they're all right here inside our space. And so that's how the Mingos Access Center was uh, was um, basically formalized through students. And so we are now even strengthening the space because we have now large print keyboards that allows persons who are low vision, who can't see the really small, you don't really notice how small the keyboards are until you see these large prints. <laughs> <laughs> and all the time, you just thought that that was just the only size you could get in keyboards. So we now have large print keyboards to assist with that. Our desktops are retrofitted with an app or a program called NVDA. That is a free app that can go on any devices as well as laptops um, that turns text into speech. So if you're unable to use your visual components or site to receive written information, it will read it out to you. No matter what website you're on, no matter what you're using, what, what program you're using, Microsoft Office, Microsoft Outlook, it reads it out to you. We also have headphones because we need noise canceling headphones for those persons who are in the neurodiverse, who have sensitivity to sound. We're able to utilize those. They're able to utilize those, but also for those who are using the NVDA, it's reading out loud so it gives you privacy and it doesn't distract anyone else. Um, we also created a sensory free room. And when I say that, people say, oh, what? And it's actually a really good resource that you will find um, around universities worldwide. They're up there, not only universities, but grade school, primary, junior, high schools. You're finding that these are being implemented in educational spaces to provide um, students, faculty, and staff who are overwhelmed, overstimulated, who needs to burn off some energy before a class, or who needs to take a moment to just use some of those skills, those strategies that, that calms you, that prepares you to be focused. Um, we have sensory tools, sensory 
toys and tools because some do look like toys and some do look like tools that allows persons to also heighten their focus um, calm um, when they're having sensory overload we have continue within the Mingos Access Center to really really change the way that students that um, the community that prospective students, administration, faculty, and staff with disabilities. Um, our communities are now coming into the space, into, into higher learning spaces, and not being so afraid to ask, where can I get this? How can I do that? Can Is there anything available for me that can help me um, be successful in my goals and my career leadership goals um, through the University of the Bahamas. And so we've been supporting all of our communities, the Ministry of Education, um, we the library, I mean, you name it. <laughs> I'm sure we have touched it somehow. And if we haven't touched it, we're on our way. <laughs> so look out for us. <laughs> Well, listen, Erin, thank you so much for that. As we begin to wrap up, as we wrap up our show, why is it important for that student or for that parent who has not yet self-identified, they may be a little timid, they may still not have accepted the reality of whatever their disability is, there is trepidation, there's that shame, there's that, there's so many emotions often associated, the stigma, Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why is it important for that person who has not embraced whatever their circumstances to do so? And I want you to share with them, how can the help transform their lives and their experience living with a disability? That is such a... Uh profound question as simple as it sounds it's a profound question because a lot of how we see ourselves and how society sees us uh living in marginal groups marginalized groups so that's the vulnerable groups that's persons who may live in um, poverty persons who may not have their first language as English, persons who use sign language as their primary communication um, language, we're faced with trying to find a balance of who we are and our value. And because of a lot of our lived experiences have not been pleasant ones, have been faced with us being told our value, um, not really amplifying our voices. We still are hesitant, afraid, um, confused and frustrated on how to do that. And so this is why it's so important that when the first question you asked, when it concerned basically, how do we become more sensitive and how do we become more aware of disabilities, whether apparent or non-apparent, and it's because we need to see ourselves in others. We need to recognize that disability is intersectional. It does not matter your sex, your gender, your religion, your sexual orientation, where you live, how much money you have in the bank, how much education you have, <laughs> your geographical um, presence. It does not matter any of those things. You can acquire a disability. The difference that um, you will encounter when you have acquired a disability, it may be temporary and the temporary space is full of options. You may get a pair of crutches because you have insurance. You may even get therapy because it's built in. Um, you then have time off from work because you get medical leave, sick leave. All of these things are kind of built in for a very small demographic of people. Then you have those persons who have no access to any of that, even though it is a need temporary or permanently. And now they're trying to navigate um, what to do. Am I even supposed to be successful? These are the things that that are that we go through in our thinking. And um, and so 
it is important we recognize that we are human beings first. Your voice is important. You are, life is designed for your growth and growth is not pretty. Barriers is experienced by everyone. Yet there are additional support that has to happen and only can happen if you show up. You have to decide to show up just the way you are. Because the things that you need are available. You just may not know where it is. And yes, everything may have a price point on it. Do not let that be the one thing that stops you. Because there are charitable spaces. There are even things that trainings that you can take part of, scholarship opportunities that can give you not only the experience, the inclusion and the opportunities, but the access to receive the things that you need. To share your lived experiences is an absolute privilege, luxury, and pleasure. Because if we don't share, no one will ever know. And so I want to encourage you listening that life is hard. Absolutely. Um, living with a disability or in any of the vulnerable groups, we're going to experience even harder. Yet, you are designed for growth and you are designed to thrive and you have value just the way you are. But it starts with you. And so I want to encourage you to look to persons like myself, look to persons in your community, look to allies who are ready to help you um, and you may not be ready. And it's okay to say, I'm not ready for that. But know that you have to take the steps when you are ready to say, okay, these are my goals. Can you help me? And stay committed to it. That is what I would say. Whether that's recreational, whether that is educational, whether that is professional, um, whether it is personal goals that you have, it all takes the same amount of energy. Yeah, you have to show up. You have to show up. Erin, before we go, time has escaped us. <laughs> I want you to share with people where your office is located so that if they want to recommend or suggest that somebody visits your office, um, they know exactly where to find you on our campus. Okay. So we are on the main campus in um, Nassau, Bahamas. And oh, if I forgot to say it before, we also provide services to UB North. So if you're listening at UB North, please contact us, um, disabilities office at ub.edu.bs. But we are located on the main campus on University Drive in Nassau, Bahamas. We are in the Keva M. Bethel building. That is the entrance on Ponciana. Ponciana is the roundabout right across from Commonwealth Bank. You enter there. When you enter there, you can park, come through the doors, which is the Performing Arts Center. And when you exit to the right, you're not going to miss us because as you keep walking, the wall that you come to is the Mingos Access Center. You're going to see the signage. If you ever get lost, don't worry, just ask. Everyone knows where we are at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Everybody knows where you are at this point. Erin, thank you so much for taking the time to sit with me today to talk about the Mingos Access Center and the Office of Compliance and Disabilities. This has been, a, am sure, an eye opener for a lot of our listeners. And that's what we aim to do. We aim to educate our listeners about the ways that we at the university are supporting student success. At the end of the day, that is our ultimate goal and mission to ensure that our students succeed, whether mm -hmm. they have visible, invisible, or no disability at all. Mm -hmm. That is why we do what we do. So I wish you absolute success in this journey as you continue to support our students. And I'm sure they are grateful. They see you like their mom or big <laughs> sister or yes, you, you are a nurturer in that regard. Thank you. And thank you to my listening audience for joining us today. Be sure to follow us 
on our website at www.ub.edu.bs. And you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And be sure to join us same time, same radio station for another exciting edition of University Drive next week. I'm your host, Nikki Bow. Enjoy the remainder of your day. University Drive is a production of the Office of University Relations and the Communications and Creative Arts Academic Unit at University of the Bahamas. All rights reserved.